What's up, punks? It's Shinobi, and we're bringing you Block Digest number 193 on uh, mm, some day of the week, which happens to be October 2nd at block height 597,567. My brain is perfect, flawless, and I had no brain farts there whatsoever. What's going on, Rick? Yeah, it's definitely October the 2nd, and it's definitely a Wednesday when we're always recording on a Wednesday. For the most part, we try to record on a Wednesday. So it is Wednesday, October 2nd, but you guys will be listening to this. It'll probably be Thursday, October 3rd. Hope you guys are doing all right. How about you, Janine Nopar? How are y'all doing this morning? I'm good. It's the day before uh, the famous Unity Day in Germany. So Unity, yeah. That's like the day the wall came down. Uh, well, I don't, I don't actually remember the specific day that that happened, but yeah, I think. Oh God, I have to now. I feel really embarrassed. It's, oh, it's, no. it's. I mean, it's the day that. Um, Germany. It's basically just the day that Germany officially reunited. I don't know if that it's specifically the day that the wall started to come down, but. Yeah, that was was that was some recent history. Yeah, so it's time to celebrate. How about you, Nopar? What's going on where you're at? Uh, I'm in a refactoring hell right now. Uh, like two months ago, I created a pull request to Wasabi. And uh, well, back in the day, I would be like just, okay, I coded. Uh, it's in Wasabi and we are happy. But now things have changed and I'm like, okay, no one's going to be able to review it. So I have to break it down. And last two months, I'm breaking breaking it down and and I finally created the final pull request and it turns out to be too complex too so I have to break it down further <laughs> <laughs> that's what happens with these overly complex subjects it's a lot of breaking down but once it's broken down you're good yeah it's like bit more and more like bitcoin core <laughs> yeah I mean it's like it sucks, but I think that's going to be the reality for pretty much every wallet out there once we actually have like a full stack that they're all using. Also, yeah. I'm curious to know how many people in here are here because of the Tales of the Crypt episode, because I feel like there's a lot of people today. <laughs> Probably a lot. Uh, you know, Marty and, uh, and Matt, uh, a little more high profile than us <laughs> by a big degree. Yeah, that was yeah. definitely a good episode too. I mean, uh, I'm sure the Digest Twitter account picked up some some followers as well as yourself. And yeah, it does feel like we got a good audience in here with us today. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it's I I just want to say this. Like, I I really do not talk about the content I listen to, but on the off chance that some of our viewers don't already listen to to Marty and Matt, I, I doubt <laughs> that that'll be the case. Uh, go listen to them because they are one of the few. Like people in this space that I actually try to keep up with. Yeah, and definitely not comment on. Well, it's it's not a YouTube, but if it would be YouTube, then definitely not comment that I'm here because of the digest. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, if you haven't listened to their latest episode, they did have Janine on, and it was a great discussion about privacy and delete Coinbase and Block Digest came up in there and. Yeah, it's a good one. If you haven't heard it, you should go listen to it. And for sure, it is one of those guys where it's hard to sit down and listen to content when you're making content and, you know, really kind of picky about who I listen to. And, you know, those guys, Marty Bent and Matt O'Dell, Tales from the Crypt, they do a good job. So, uh, yeah, good job on there, Janine. Yeah, and to quickly correct the record, so the wall came down in November, not October. So, yeah. 
Oh uh, yeah, yeah. It's every all that. Remember, remember the eighth of November. Ah. So reunified uh, first, and then took the wall down. Okay. Oh, no, yes, the, the no, the the wall came down before, but the official reunification happened in October. Um, but the wall oh. came down the previous November. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I was trying to make a joke about our No2X, remember, remember the 8th of November title, way back, in, well, yeah, a couple yeah. years back. I remember that now. Alright, let's, yeah, so, that was a good little discussion, but there is a lot to discuss today, so maybe we should dig into it, and I mean, this first topic, man, it seems like we're gonna go way off, so, what's going on, man, with this uh, global Green New Deal? Yeah, um... So this one, you know, it's, you, you might wonder what the fuck does this have to do with Bitcoin? But, uh, you know, if you, if you really watch the show for a while, we do this a lot. Like there, there are a lot of things going on in the world that are tangentially relevant to it, even if not directly involved. But, you know, pretty much um, the, the U United Nations um, Trade Investment and Development Agency um, is now calling for a global a uh, green new deal um you know kind of in, in comparison to the insanity that our freshman congressman um alexandria ocasio cortez is trying to push in america on a national level and you know it's the, the reason i kind of wanted to talk about this is just you know how this relates to the overall global economic situation going on right now and it's pretty much you know, the, the rationale, like a direct quote from, from the article on this I'm reading is what is needed is to apply the same ambitious model used in the United States to overcome the Great Depression in the 1930s and apply it at a global scale. And I just want you like, to think about that for a second, because the reality of the matter is the things we did as a country during the Great Depression, the, the Green New Deal, all of the, the public spending, that's not what got us out of the Depression at all. That, that, in fact, all of those things actually exacerbated the underlying problems and made it worse, made the Depression last longer. And what actually drug us out of that was World War II, where we literally ran an economy fighting a war. And then after that war, got to bootstrap an economy, literally rebuilding half of the world that got bombed to shit in one of the biggest wars on this planet's history. So like the, the first thing here is just the, the justification for this is showing a, a complete failure to understand the reality of what even caused the Great Depression in the first place and what actually pulled us out of it. Like they're, they're looking at the actions the United States government took that made things worse as if they're the solution to that. And they want to apply this to the entire world. Like, that's insane. And it, it really, like, the, kind of the, just the, the number of factors going into this, I think the, the most illuminating part about this is the, the rationale beyond just looking at the, the Great Depression in history is, is the fear of a huge economic recession in 2020. So like one, one of the big points that they, 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 they put out there is a, a, a rationalization for this, a justification for this, a reason for it, is the economy is going to slow down. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not just to fix the environment, like global warming and, and, and temperature change are going to kill us all. It's the economy is going to fuck up. And if we if we spend all this money with this, this public investment in infrastructure and this global Green New Deal, we can stop the economy from slowing down. Because the, the reality is here, like, climate change is happening. And frankly, I think if you deny that, you're an idiot. But, you know, any rational person can look over the past 30 or 40 years and see that the projected timelines for effects have never panned out, have never been as extreme as people project them. And 
the solutions people put forward to address and kind of mitigate or adapt to climate change are just completely economically nonsense or even scientifically nonsense in a lot of the cases. Like just looking at it from a physics um, re return of investment of energy, like how, how much energy you get back out of something, investing some amount of energy into it. It's like one of the most basic things you look at in terms of energy sources. And, you know, it's, it's, this is all to keep the economic system going, to keep that framework of control going. And at the end of the day, it really has nothing to do with protecting the environment. It's controlling the economy. And I think like seeing this push from, from this UN organization for this and, and, and how this is going to play out, the, the, the further arguments they continue to make and refine is going to spell this out even more clearly than it already is now. Like this has nothing to do with protecting the environment. This is about maintaining systems of economic control. Well, man, I mean, the Green New Deal and climate change and all this is buzzworthy for sure. I mean, um, what's her what's her name? Greta Thunberg? Boy, she's been causing some uproar recently, uh, getting everybody to talk about this subject. And, you know, it is important, but I don't know. It's one of those where, yeah, it's really hard to say, like, what exactly the roadmap is to turn us around to where, you know, the future is going to be okay because the future is never certain. And like, uh, you know, what works for us today, we might find out is a terrible way to move forward a couple of years from now. And, you know, the best we can do is try and just adjust. But yeah, I mean, this would essentially, you know, you try and build out this sort of huge system to try and solve this big problem. And, you know, really you're just destroying your economies before you would ever have a problem with the climate. So, yeah. um, yeah, it's uh it's one of those things where, you know, there's a lot of counterintuitive stuff there where it's like uh with Bitcoin, a lot of people want to say, well, Bitcoin's destroying the world because there's so much hash rate, there's too much electricity being used for Bitcoin. And it's like people Bitcoin is the only way to collateralize cheap electricity and move it outside of the borders of that country. And without that then it's really hard to actually develop renewable technologies because there's not really a profit incentive to do so. So, I mean, there's things like that where it's like Bitcoin is actually helping reverse the stem of coal and, you know, dirty electricity to more renewable routes of electricity. But that's going to take a while and it's a slow process. And I mean, you know, maybe that's where it's like if there is a Green New Deal, we should start talking about how we should be modernizing all our electricity plants for renewable sources and, you know, start mining or something like that yeah, instead yes. of just let's change everything to where we know we'll be OK in the future. I, we'll never know we'll be OK. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, r r real quick, I, I just want to say, you know, re regarding. Um, um, Greta. Sina, yeah, Greta. Yeah. It's. Um, you know, it's she. She's a kid. She she is literally an autistic hey. child being taken what? advantage of. Like, leave her the fuck alone. Like, get mad at the adults, like manipulating her like this. But you know, back to, to the core of the point, though. It's like you know, look at Germany versus France. Germany, all renewable, but they shut down all their nuclear power plants and moved to solar and wind. And now their net coal use has skyrocketed because those things aren't reliable enough. Whereas France uh, made huge investments in nuclear power and their 72% of their energy is generated by nuclear plants now. And it's literally the cheapest electricity rates in Europe. It's like, you know, th these types of programs, like if they were actually about fixing the environment, would be doing what France is doing. But all these programs try to push the kind of shit that Germany did. And it doesn't work. It distorts the shit out of the economy. And it's just another excuse to try to keep ramping up the scale at which they play these types of money creation and manipulation games to just manipulate the whole economy. Oh, man. Yeah, I'm just thinking about renewables and energy and, you know, the way it is like right now, it's this is one of the reasons I'm in Bitcoin, man. I mean, it's like subconsciously, it's like you kind of know it. But I mean, like, I mean, maybe my experience of seeing it a little bit more where it's like, you know, all these reserves and banking is bank banked on 
oil reserves as their asset to settle on. And I mean, that takes a lot of burning oil to protect those oil fields. And I mean, there's just so much on the back of that where it's like, you know, there's a lot of environmental costs just to keep that thing running. And um, yeah, you know, a lot of people just want to look at one symptom and say like, here's how we can fix this symptom instead of like looking at the root cause as to how all this stuff is appearing and then just attacking it that direction instead. They're going to use all this information to try and cloud your judgment to say we need a global green new deal. It's yeah, it sounds pretty wild. Yeah, so you, you want to help the environment? Good. So do I. Um, do the math. Pick the solutions that actually work, and don't just blindly fall into these kinds of traps that are more about just keeping you under control than actually helping the environment. Oh man, the UN. What a uh... Yeah, what a problem there. All right, if there's not any more comment, we can go into something a little bit more. Well, I mean, this is going to be kind of thematic through the show. Well, well, guys, the SEC is out in full force on today's show, and it appears they're taking applications for easy fine settlement or harsh fine settlement. I don't know. We'll get to more of that later. For now, Overstocks.com CEO Patrick Byrne and the company's CFO Gregory Iverson were charged in a Utah court for two counts of federal securities fraud. Overstock became the first major retail outlet to accept Bitcoin back in January of 2014. The price rise of Bitcoin stacked large gains for the company, but the reality is the business was in shambles. The lawsuit alleges that the two, quote, embarked on a blockchain strategy designed to profit on new markets for cryptocurrency. In fact, it was recently reported that for the last several years, Defendant Byrne spent no fewer than 220 days a year on the road spreading his blockchain gospel, despite the fact that Overstock was hemorrhaging cash, close quote. This has to do with their platform T0, which was launched back in December of 2017. The idea was to turn Overstock into a crypto exchange, but it seems like there were ulterior motives that never played out, and that, that never played out. Plaintiffs in this case alleged that this, this was a ploy to get, quote, revenge upon short sellers and tried to create a short squeeze by offering a digital token dividend that would not be registered and could not be resold for at least six months. The lockup period created by the issuance of an unregistered security effectively resulted in the inability of short sellers to deliver the security upon the surrender of their shares, close quote. Plaintiffs also say this strategy was thwarted by the SEC and market participants before it really got off the ground. However, the damage had already been done and Patrick Byrne made off with 102 million of stocks sold from the company Overstock. Quote, the damage was done and made worse by an alleged failure to disclose conditions that were adversely affecting the company, which enabled them, among other things, to sell additional shares of Overstock in the market to create a cash fund necessary to support its crypto project in the face of them abandoning, abandoned by investment partners, close quote. Now Gregory Iverson just resigned last month on September 17th, and CEO Patrick Byrne resigned just a little before that on August 22nd. All of this comes on the heels of Patrick Byrne making bizarre statements on mainstream media sources. You might remember, in the beginning of August, he went to a few major news outlets to tell his story of working with the men in black to try and fight Russia's influence on our country. He put himself in the middle of the Russiagate story just before it imploded. A lot of ridiculous statements were made on those programs like, quote, There is a deep state like a submarine lurking just beneath the waves of the periscope death watching our shipping lanes and a nuclear icebreaker called the USS Bill Barr has snuck up on them with and is about to ram midship, close quote. And he also said, quote, I plan on sitting back and watching the United States Department of Justice reestablish the rule of law in our country, close quote. Okay, so that rule of law is coming down on top of him. Now, as he not only didn't disclose damning information about the company to investors, but he also worked against his investors to take more of their money while also driving the company into the dirt, being the traveling blockchain medicine man and going Russiagate nuts all over the media, and that he was still a CEO at the time. I'd say a lot of investors were definitely hurt, and it looks like they will have to pay some sort of fine, or maybe if the rule of law actually meant anything, they'll sit in a cell for a brief stint. I doubt that, but we'll see. But yeah, that's the case right now with Overstock and their CEO and CFO. Uh, would you guys have any comment on this? 
Well, I mean, this seems like a huge can of worms. I mean, like, you know, I'm not going to lie. Like, that that structure effectively trying to prevent short selling uh, with, a, with a stock token sounds shady as fuck. But it's like I, I don't I don't really know how to kind of try and disentangle that from all the other shit he was involved with with you know um, Maria Butina I think her name was you know the the government in this whole Russia situation it's because yeah, yeah. it's like you know if I looking at the, the whole token and, and that structure in isolation like that's shady as fuck but it's like knowing all this other stuff happened it's like some part of me wonders like what else was going on at this time you know what i mean that that might have in informed that decision a bit but you know th that said though like that that does seem pretty fucking shady to try to engineer like a, a security token that you can't short sell like that that's completely undermining the, the entire function of a market yeah it looks like uh you know the SEC took note of it, and luckily the market participants that were involved basically uh, kind of held their feet to the fire, and now they're in the situation they're in. And yeah, I'd be kind of curious as to know like what are the actual forces that got them moving in this direction because, I mean, back in 2016, I want to say, maybe 2017 even, there was like headline after headline of Overstock just killing it with the price rise of Bitcoin. And, you know, it seemed like they were in a sure-footed place to retire and just say like, hey, we made enough money with Overstock, you know, we'll sell this company, sit on our Bitcoin and do fine. Instead, they went this route, they did the token, they uh, started trying to build the exchange, came out with the Russiagate nonsense. Seems like there's definitely some, some sort of drama in the background that got all of this stuff moving in this direction. Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, you know, it's especially like they, they were really early um, as far as businesses that accepted Bitcoin and actually held some percentage of it as Bitcoin after accepting it. Like they, they were really early with that. And then yeah. like their whole T0 platform, you know, like they were gearing up to try to be the security token platform in this space. And like I, I think, you know, personally, I think Liquid um, by Blockstream and things built on elements are going to just completely dominate that but like they were one of the first people really trying to build a comprehensive system for that oh man well it's not so comprehensive anymore and who knows how much longer we'll even see the company overstock sitting around i mean maybe the uh the people that are involved here will be able to take over the reins and sort of get the ship back under control but for right now everything's kind of spiraling Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think like, you know, just th this whole like token structure situation would have come to this point on its own, I think. But like with all the other stuff that Patrick Byrne got involved in is like, yeah, that this is going to have very bad fallout for that company in the long term. I mean, correct me if I remember wrong, but Patrick got some disease uh, and that's why he resigned. Uh, and it wasn't like uh, he was running away. He he just got really, really sick. Mm. Yeah, he's mentally sick, man. I mean, like, he went on there and started doing the Russiagate thing, and then, like, a couple, like, a week later quit, and then, like, a couple months later, we're seeing this uh, lawsuit against him. So, I mean, like, yeah. he probably is mentally not stable right now. He probably is going through a lot. And, I mean, like, that's probably not a lie. He probably is not mentally fit for that duty. Well, I mean, it's like, man, that that's, I think, not something we can be certain about. But I can definitely say if if he's not lying about this entire Russia situation, I, I don't see anything in that to make me believe he is. Then it's like, that's a crazy stressful situation to be in. Yeah, I don't even know about, yeah, like that. And if there's truth to that, that's a whole nother level of stress. Just being involved in the lawsuit and trying to start a crypto exchange and working the regulatory hurdles that are all involved with that and like leaving one company and starting another and what all that entails. I mean, you know, it just, 
if you're starting a company and you you care about your other company, you know, you should be thinking about the ramifications of what saying those sort of things in that sort of public light is going to do to your investors. And it's just obvious he wasn't thinking about that. He was trying to, I don't know, man. I mean, maybe deflect sort of uh, just some of the stuff coming his way from the SEC and trying to like, you know, levy some sort of connection he had with uh, regulators and a different branch of government. I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, I really, yeah, I mean, I, I really don't know what to make of the whole Patrick angle or like aspect of this, but I, I, I don't see things going too well for Overstock, especially in, in regards to like trying to get T0 actually up and, and running and used. Yeah, like you're saying, T zero is uh, it's uh, spiraling, and um, yeah, Janine, if you want to take this into the next one, if there's no more comment, uh, we got some other stuff that's spiraling out of control. Yeah, so uh, you guys may have seen a tweet going around about Zcash uh, a couple of days ago, and so there's actually quite a lot to that story beyond the tweet so or around surrounding the tweet um basically the electric coin company tweeted a security announcement on september 24th that said we have just released zcash d version 2.07-3 uh, or 2.0-3 which includes an important security fix in response to an issue that was reported to us on september 15th 2019 all operators of Zcash D should upgrade their nodes ASAP. Um, and then they linked to a post uh, that also said that uh, version zero or version 2.0.7-3 of Zcash D includes an important security fix in response to an issue that was reported to us on Friday, September 13th by Florian uh, Tamer, uh, Dan Bone, and Kenneth G. Pedersen. Uh, user again they say users should upgrade their nodes to this version immediately and discontinue use of older versions and then they say please note that this issue does not put funds at risk of theft or counterfeiting more details of the issue will be released in coordination with the uh, reporters of the issue at a future date uh, well the interesting thing is um, then someone else uh, on September 28th uh, Jonathan Duke Leto actually, uh, and he's an open source developer, decided to publish a blog post that claimed to give more information about what that vulnerability was that was supposedly fixed through this update. And essentially what happened is because Zcash forked Bitcoin version 0.11.2, um, there was at that time there wasn't any isolation between your private keys and the node operations. Um, and this was later fixed uh, in if you were using the you know Bitcoin wallet that comes with Bitcoin Core. Um, this was later fixed, obviously, but obviously, um, or not so obviously, most fork coins um, don't actually keep up with this stuff, uh, which is funny. Which is funny because you know they're, <laughs> I mean, they're basically being given free work all the time if they're a fork of Bitcoin. You know, they should be keeping up at minimum with the security updates that are happening in Bitcoin, but apparently they're not. Um, so in Zcash, there was basically a bug where attackers could link shielded addresses to the IP addresses of nodes that control them. Uh, or as Adam Beck explained in more detail, there's a bug in Zcash where you can ask a node to relay a malformed transaction. It will get rejected, but nodes that own or have view keys of those shielded addresses throw an exception and react differently, which you can see. So you can use it to find out which node owns a shielded coin. Um, and so in the post by Leto, he says that this affects a long list of Zcash forked coins as well, as in uh, blockchains that use code that was forked from Zcash, which was then a fork of Bitcoin. Um, so a long list of fork coins that also use shielded addresses, um, he includes that in his blog post. And some of them uh, have no longer have this vulnerability, like there's a couple that aren't. So don't just assume that if a coin is forked from Zcash that it's, it definitely is vulnerable because there's a few that aren't. This is ridiculous, dude. <laughs> like, they have 
a forked version of Bitcoin where the issue was already fixed and they didn't go back to look at it and say like, you know, we might want to implement that fix so that our shielded addresses don't get isolated, delete their IP addresses. So, uh, no, Cara, yeah. do you want to laugh at them fucking up network level privacy first or, or, or can I go first? You, you guys take it. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I just, I just want to say that there is just no way to keep up with Bitcoin core changes. Like it's, it's impossible. I, I'm not even sure even those who are working on Bitcoin core can keep up with the changes. <laughs> But I mean, it's like, like you spend all your your time making this new shit coin with like, it magically fixes on-chain privacy. And then you completely fuck that up by fucking up network level privacy. And not, not even just fucking up network level privacy, like fucking up network level privacy with a full node. Yeah, th there is a certain level of irony there. Um, well, I mean, network level privacy is not that sexy, so people are not concentrating on that that much. Uh, that might be th that. That's one of the things what I actually like in Monero that they are uh, doing good things there. Yeah, and so. Um, in addition, I just want to point out, um, Leto said that if you have ever used shielded addresses to receive Zcash coins, then you are affected. If you have only ever sent coins to shielded addresses, then you're fine, but obviously the person receiving is not. Um, also, if you've, you, if you've always used Tor and or Tails, um, the operating system, with your Zcash node, then obviously the leak of IP addresses won't be harmful to you. Um, they still, I don't know whether there's still a possibility that they could correlate, um, you know, depending on your use of Tor, whether they could still correlate the addresses together, hopefully not. But, um, the, it, the kind of, I wanted to go over the reaction as well, um, which is that some people in Zcash, including Sean Bowie, who was responsible for committing the sapling code in 2016 that included this vulnerability, um, they're criticizing Leto mm -hmm. for for basically shitting on whatever the planned disclosure uh, was. And yeah, I mean, Leto, the, th the, the key difference I want to point out here, the really important part that I think justifies um, him warning people about this in advance is that Leto believes, as he writes in his blog post, that the course of action that users need to take in order to protect themselves um, against this because they don't know whether they've been, you know, exposed by, through this vulnerability. He actually recommends that people have to create a whole new wallet.dat file, create brand new shielded addresses, and then send all of their funds to new addresses. Um, which, Dude. so if you read the current security advisory that Zcash gave when they, you know, published this whole update now thing on the 24th, they do not include that as a piece of advice. Now, you know, you know, so I don't know, I haven't spent enough time looking into this to know whether they agree that that's a per, uh, proper advice to give in terms of like people having to create whole new wallets. So it's possible that they don't agree with that, they don't think that's necessary, and that's why they haven't given that advice. But I think it's important that if that's not the case, they should probably say so. Um, because otherwise they are like, otherwise Leto's position and the fact that he published the blog post ahead of the disclosure is entirely justified because the, the warning that Zcash has given so far is not sufficient and does not include that. So from my position, as long as that's true, that that is actually necessary, I think he's entirely justified in publishing what he did. And granted, only a very small percentage of Zcash users even enable shielded addresses, so this isn't going to affect a ton of people, but we don't know who those people are or the situations that they're in and why they're transacting. So if they have been exposed or if they get exposed because now attackers are using this, because um, it's now out in the open about you know the fact that this can happen, um, that could be devastating to those small amount of people because if you have such 
a small anonymity set of people using shielded addresses, that actually obviously makes it vastly easier for an attacker to figure out who has the shielded coins. Um, not even like if everyone was using shielded coins. I mean, that would already this would still be a problem then, but it's even worse because you have fewer people using them. So yeah, in his section, um, I wanted to read this also, in his section that he labeled owning the mistake, he says, my trust in the Zcash code base has been shaken to its core and I now recommend all hush users, hush I think is the Zcash fork, um, all hush users should use Tor tails to protect against uh, future bugs like this coming from Zcash upstream. So yeah, pretty, pretty, this is pretty serious. And I'm, I mean, I'm not surprised, but I'm disappointed that they're not handling this very well. <laughs> okay, and it's like re re real quick, no part. Like I, I, I want to comment on like the the whole how this was released. Like this is absolutely in, in no way connected to private keys or control of funds. So there is absolutely no reason to try to get people to upgrade first and then release it. Like the, the, there is no threat of losing money there. You warn people as quickly as possible to mitigate this. Like the bug being revealed does not in any way put your funds at risk, just your privacy. Like there is no reason whatsoever, even if like his advice about generating a whole new wallet is unnecessary, that there there is no reason to be pissed or try to do anything but warn people as fast as possible. Yeah, so just 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 one more thing it's how how I think about Zcash uh, it's and why I don't think it's a catastrophe because I think Zcash is a fun research project and no one should use it for privacy why would you I mean it, it's built on a cryptography that's just was shaky even when it was implemented why it was implemented it's because it's much more fun to research in a way when there are some stakes but i don't think i've ever heard uh, adoption on on any darknet markets or, or or anyone who who really wants to to gain any privacy on zcash but yeah so so it, it's a fun research project uh and and no one really using it for or no one is really trying to 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 I, I hope so. At least, uh, at least, I never heard that anyone is trying to rely on Zcash's privacy. It's, it's just not adopted that way. So it's better if this is happening now. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I really hope that that's the case, and I hope that there aren't actually real people using this, expecting real privacy. Like, if it was just a bunch of people who were doing a research project and they weren't promoting it as something that people in situations that actually, you know, need privacy, need anonymity should use, then that would be fine. But you, especially recently, now that he's gotten a lot more attention, more attention from his book, people have been going back to the fact that um, Snowden recommends Zcash or like praises Zcash. And so yeah, there, I'm sure like the people who are operating on like darknet markets and stuff or cryptographers, those people all know that this is at best a research and, you know, is not at that point where it should be actually used in any vulnerable situation. But I have, you know, based on the marketing that I've seen, um, I would not be surprised if there are some people who are doing that. I really hope not, but it's 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 definitely possible. And so, because we don't know, we should, you know, anticipate the worst happening from something like this. Yeah, I mean, geez, guys, like, uh, there's a lot I wanted to say here, but for sure, it got marketed as privacy and like privacy enabled. And there was a lot of people whenever it initially came out, not a lot, but we were seeing the reports of people being arrested for using Zcash on, uh, on darknet markets. And quickly people kind of started to move back to Monero and Bitcoin. And 
I mean, so some people were legitimately hurt, but yeah, seriously, I mean, the idea that this company is marketing the fact that they're going to bring you privacy on the base layer of a blockchain, meanwhile, they're doing the things they do, it just kind of makes it to where I don't even understand how just because even it's funded by investors, why investors would even want to stick around anymore whenever their privacy is all about like maintaining their vulnerabilities in like this little cohort of developers they have I mean you can go back and watch episode 136 the Bitcoin is ripe where I did a story on the sapling release and how I actually went to a Zcash meeting for that and like heard Zoku talk about how these like uh, the sapling update was to try and fix an inflation bug that came out with the original release and that inflation bug you know I mean that thing sat around for a year and like where's that inflated Zcash like we don't know basically the whole move was they said at that time was this was a slowly phased in hard fork to where those old shielded Zcash addresses wouldn't be uh, you know valid anymore and so I'm sure like that this is part of that and like with it in this phased in hard fork to fit in and fix an inflation bug back in 2016 2017 uh, fixed in 2018 I mean, now we get this, oh, we got to fix the fact that our shielded addresses have an isolation bug that leaked their IP addresses. Like, who the F takes this project seriously in any way that it's going to bring some sort of level of network privacy on a base layer of a blockchain? If you're an investor in Zcash still, then yeah, you, you, you're probably one of those dumb money people. You need to lose that money because this is stupid. Yeah, I mean, as a side note, I also want to point out, because I, I went to, you know, the, the ECC, Electric Coin Company, and the Zcash Foundation Twitter to see whether they had made any other additional response besides the um, security advisory from the 24th. And actually, one of the top tweets at the Electric Coin Company is a retweet of Global Digital Finance, which is yeah. some, they're bio say, says that there's some kind of industry body promoting the development of best practices and conduct standards for crypto assets. And they apparently did some kind of event or speaking session, and they said that their AML working group co-chair is Zoku. And there's a picture of him giving a presentation, and it's like, why, why is the Zcash or sorry, the Electric Coin Company CEO, why is he the co-chair of an AML working group? Like, it's just yeah, why? Because there's a lot going on here. Enough that privacy to, to still let us catch criminals. Well, yeah, this is like, okay, this is another thing I forgot to leave out, which like, I'm not going to say that Zoku's stupid because there is something going on that he understands. And I mean, this came from an off the cuff discussion on the street. Like, I mean, this wasn't in any kind of meeting or anything. And uh, at the time, like uh, this was about the time that uh, Zcash had got the New York license, and at that time, Monero users were starting to get arrested on the darknet market. Like all this darknet market, uh, you know, working group stuff started to take effect, and we started to see really a lot of people get arrested. And I asked him about it. I was like, "We think about that sort of thing whenever people are starting to use Zcash." And he goes, "Well, you know, there's this interesting." thing going on with cryptography where you can't actually test your cryptography unless there's enough criminal action on that layer of cryptography to try and force the government's hand to break that encryption. So he definitely marketed it as privacy to try and attract criminal activity on the chain to try and attract, attract government cracking of his encryption. Like he's not stupid. There's something going on there with this project that's a that doesn't seem like it's got anything to do with creating a new form of money. That's... Yeah. I mean, dude, Rick, I think, like, Zoku, whatever you want to think about the guy, was much more concerned with making a job for himself uh, than anything else involved in, in setting up Zcash. I don't know, man. That working group, we don't know in there. Yeah. I don't know. Is there any more, uh, you know, comments on this, or should we move along into the next? No. One? Yeah, let's go to something with some real privacy. What's going on here, Nora? Well, I cannot say if it's real privacy or not because this is behind the paywall. But Chinese researchers uh, came up with Tumblebit Plus Plus, which is 
they are merging Humberbit with confidential transactions, which is interesting. However, from the abstract, it was not clear to me if they are using confidential transactions as they as as it needs consensus change to the Bitcoin base layer or they are actually using it only in the Tumblebit hub so there isn't any any issue and, and we can just implement it uh, to today. So the thing is uh, this came out of nowhere and it came out of nowhere today so it's very fresh you might hear about that uh, just a little bit background of Tumblebit. Uh, Tumblebit is a unidirectional payment channel, um, which we implemented it back then in a way that uh, is it acts like a Bitcoin mixer, which was just a very very slow Bitcoin mixer and expensive too. Uh, but also Tumblebit has payment hub mode, which is very similar to the Lightning network except that it's not a network, it's only one hub, but what happens inside that hub uh, is private. Um, the Lightning Network gains its privacy by the money is moving between the, the, the hubs and Tumblebit is actually inside the hub, is, is, is private. Now, the problem with this hub model was back then is that uh, well, it was unidirectional. So you open a you open a channel and you send the money, and you cannot receive. Um, okay. Uh, the other thing is that you can only send like equal amounts, and this is what they have sold with 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 this. And I suspect. What they are doing is that they are taking confidential transactions as a given, uh, which of course needs consensus change. So that's why I actually did not get into and buy the paper and look into that because I suspect it's just not applicable today. Uh, but 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 it's definitely I mean, an improvement, yeah. probably. Uh, we'll see. I mean, not applicable today on the main chain, but Liquid has CP. Uh, any blockchain you spin up based on elements has CP support. So, like, that could get really interesting. Because, it, like, if, if it's been a long time since I've, like, looked at and gone over Tumblebit. But from what I remember correctly, like, the what we could do right now... Um, without changes was pretty much just like the one round mixing functionality and that the the actual like payment hub mode was where like a lot of problems were cropping up i mean like as you know you, you probably go into that a lot, a lot better than i uh, can but if this ct um you know problem maybe helps making a payment hub mode easier to implement i mean you might not be able to do that on the main chain but why not do something like that on top of Liquid or another element space sidechain? Because it's not Bitcoin, I don't know. There it is. It's just not, it's not completely trustless Bitcoin. But I think with all the things you can put together there, it would be pretty close to it effectively. I, okay, but then why why not do confidential uh why not do coin join them it's it's much simpler to implement well because if, because if we can go from um getting the mixing mode working to a payment hub mode working while well, now you have a, a new payments layer that you can start trying to plug into lightning like i remember like um I don't think I've seen him really follow up on this anywhere that I, I've seen at least. But I, I remember like two years ago or something, like Rose Beef was, was talking about, you know, he had some vague ideas on how to try to kind of shoehorn 
uh, Tumblebit servers into the Lightning Network. So that would just be like a hop uh, through like a Lightning Panel. Yeah, it's not base layer, but I mean, like that's enough layering there where you could certainly get the privacy. Actually, I'm just trying to trying to un uncomplicate it in myself because uh, as as you you talked about, I don't remember either. I mean, this is a unidirectional payment hub, but but so you you can receive or can't receive or. Well, I think the how, how does it work? If, if I remember right, the whole issue was you needed double collateralization um, for receiving, and like that, I think was part of the um, issues with uh, like getting the the payment hub mode working. You know, I think yeah, I think no part. We're we're gonna have to try and like get our hands on an actual copy of this paper and like go through it and refresh on some stuff and maybe come back to this for a little bit uh next week you know what i mean yeah sure it's okay fuck that i buy it <laughs> so what's happening with coin liquid launches uh well this is mostly just a, a kind of quick update um coin nut um well, sorry, uh, but they're they're an exchange in Singapore, and they've just uh, launched their liquid support uh, this week. So, if memory serves me properly, um, that's Bitfinex um, and the Rock live on Liquid right now. Um, Bitmax in a beta phase, and then CoinNut would be the fourth um, live exchange, I think now. But you know, this is this is kind of something I said when they first announced the uh, the network launch and uh, the actual network going live is you know they they that was all of the the businesses in the federation getting their HSM set up, but you still have all the steps of integrating like that liquid node into their wallet systems. Their backend systems, like their explorer systems, that had like that is nowhere near <laughs> as quick as finding a place to set that box up and, and turning it on. And so, you know, it's I think we're this is just going to be one of those stories where it's, we're going to constantly see these new exchanges finally launching their support, you know, over time, and then it's just just going to hit one day that like, oh, people are actually using this for large arbitrage trades now. And I, I don't think there's really, I don't think we're going to have like that one moment where it's like, oh, Liquid's actually succeeding now. It, it'll just slowly snowball there. Cricket. All right, man. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, just excited to see uh, Liquid stuff move forward and, you know, yeah, just keep developing that stuff out. I'm just thinking about, man, we got to, you know, get more people in there and more people auditing and just thinking about, man, it's had like two plus years with that bolt spec and then this thing, whatever. But yeah. All right. And then into the next one. Um, and I just want to say real quick, guys, um, I, I, I never cover the Blockstream stories as first ones anymore because the rest of the guys won't won't let me because they don't think it's fair that, that, that I get a, a bonus and they don't. It's fucking bullshit. But uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> the uh the third um article in the the series <clears throat> that Blockstream has been putting out on uh plugins for C Lightning they've been building is out. And I think this is really reinforcing where I think that that piece of software is going in the long term and like why they went for this entire plugin architecture. Uh so Christian Decker um, has created a plugin called Prometheus. And it's designed effectively to connect your node to um, a piece of software called uh, Prometheus, which is effectively just like a, uh, like a data store um, software to receive and organize large amounts of data. 
Um, <clears throat> an alert manager, um, another app by Prometheus that can set up alerts um, based on what the, the core Prometheus is processing. And then this app, uh, Grafana, I think is how you pronounce it, which is pretty much just like a graphing software. And the, the core plugin pretty much just uh, scrapes your lightning node um, through port 9900 um, on your local machine and you know facilitates this so that it's literally just dumping all of the data from your node into this Prometheus software. And you can customize the uh, Grafana program to display all kinds of data graphically how you want, like a nice little, um, not, I don't know what they're actually called, but like the, the speedometer charts that kind of do the same thing as a pie chart graphically for your um, fund distribution, like how much is on your side of the channel, the other side, um, individual data on specific channels, um, specific HTLCs in flight in channels and the alert um, program that the, the plugin interacts with um, through the, the main Prometheus program is actually set up to plug into all kinds of other systems and protocols. It, it can forward alerts through SMTP, through Slack, through, um, sorry, what were some of the other ones? Um, yeah, like mo most of the, the major platforms out there as far as um, things used for communications in corporate or professional environments, the alert plugin um, can actually send those alerts out through those other platforms directly through the API. And so this is pretty much like just something you drop in your node and with these other softwares you have a highly customizable um, you know, graph system to visually analyze however you want to set it up all of the data involved in your nodes and a completely customizable alert system that can plug into all of these different communication channels and instantly alert you when any kind of problem pops up. Network um, connection issues like channels going down, uh, liquidity being spread around badly, like well, whatever you want to get an alert for when it's going on with your lightning node, like this entire thing is set up to do this. I mean, this is in complete contrast to how Lightning Labs is developing like their software stack. Like Lightning is Lightning Labs is trying to build the everything in one easy piece of software you just drop somewhere and start using. And Blockstream is going this completely high powered customizable like set of modules. You can just plug and play however you want. And personally, I think that the, the way Blockstream is going is absolutely going to win out in terms of architecture that people who run routing nodes will use because that's going to be the one that they can customize. It's the one they can set up and automate to do things how they want to do. It's the thing that lets them freely customize and fine tune how they're managing their, their node and their liquidity however they want as opposed to just kind of being boxed into the, the pre-packaged like set of tools that they have. And so like, you know, I, I, inherently I don't really think there's anything wrong with one approach over the other. I just think that these different design choices are going to have real impact on where these different pieces of software wind up getting used in the long term. And I think that like hands down, C Lightning is going to fill all the, the niches that, that are serious, professional, like corporate niches, anything with a very professionally managed profit incentive. And Lightning Labs software is going to be what winds up, you know, sitting on your desktop at home or being used by people who aren't really as professional of a level when, when it comes to trying to turn a profit in running this node. And, you know, I think that, that that's pretty much crystal clear at this point. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Like both of these companies are doing, you know, the, they've made their own choice as far as the niches they want to try to fill. And I think both of them will do very good jobs in those different places. Cricket. 
Oh man, yeah, another series of crickets. I'm sorry, I was like uh, paying attention to something in the chat and I got lost. Uh, yeah, Prometheus, Sea Lightning, good stuff. Alrighty, so I guess no input on that. Should we just go into the next one? I think, I think I'm gonna do yeah, that. Yeah, man, let's let's talk about something that seems a little bit more. I don't know. Just uh, yeah, there's some meat here to this story a little bit. All right. So, Matrix. Yeah, this is um, one. It's one of those stories. It's not directly Bitcoin related. So if you want to tune out for that, go ahead. But um, you know, th this is pretty much. I uh, was just scrolling through Twitter and saw this promoted tweet. It's Facebook. Um, running a social media virtual reality platform on oculus and you know i think narij from coin center hit one of the the biggest like points about this on the head is that if you actually watch this this commercial that they have like it's just people at, at, at home and cutting back and forth between that and just footage of this this vr social media platform and it's it's pretty much targeting our parents like this entire ad the 90 percent of the people that they show interacting with it this isn't young people this isn't you know the people just getting into their their early phase like this is targeting people with families settled down already well into like the, that path through adulthood and that is a weird shift and it's also just weird to finally see this happen because i mean this is this is the play that was as obvious as day from the moment facebook bought oculus uh you know they're they're going to try to do vr um and port the social media platform over to it and that's something that i was horrified of just thinking about all of the the, the 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 next levels that those invasions of privacy can go to just the, the the next level that addictive dopamine training can be taken to and seeing this i am a little less scared about that because like what what does this this ad really show in in who it's targeting they've given up on the entire younger generations the, the really young adults the the fucking millennials the kids growing up right now generation they just gave up they're they're trying to go after our parents the older generation and it makes me a little more confident you know that we're gonna have a chance at not fucking up these kinds of platforms because this looks to me like the, the, the companies who would do this the absolute wrong way, like the worst way you could try and apply VR, like this, this doesn't look like this is going to work in the long term. Like they're, they're not going after the people who would actually dive into this. They're, they're not going after the people to try and catch them and make this just a normal part of their life. They're, they're going after the adults. That's like the worst market you could go after there and so it's like th th these issues are going to to be here they're not going away but maybe you know facebook fucks up and goes under eventually and doesn't pull themselves out of the fire with shit like this and we get to try and make sure the new players who step in don't fuck this up in the way that facebook would yeah so when you started talking and you said that it was VR connected to social media, I got this horrible image in my head of like meeting <laughs> people from Twitter <laughs> over VR or them being in my like, I don't know, like seeing projections of them and stuff. <laughs> and that was very bad enough. Then I got this image of uh, what what was it? What was the second image? Oh, when you were saying it was targeted at older people. Then I got this horrible image of like a bunch of senior citizens like lying down in senior citizen homes and they're all plugged into some VR thing, which actually that is a 
that was one of the Black Mirror stories, wasn't it? It was a woman who was a lot older and she wanted to relive because she was in a coma. And the only way that she could communicate was by being plugged into some VR system. And she was a younger version of herself. Do you remember that, Shinobi? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, um, yeah. San Junipero. Yeah, so this <laughs> this has already happened. <laughs> it's already been prophesied. <laughs> We're going to plug our senior citizens into VR to keep them entertained during their horrible incarceration-like situation that they have to go through when you're at that stage in your life. But yeah, so I just got a bunch, I got a couple of different horrible images as you were talking. I'm just mostly like happy to see this because it's like you're trying to like chase the generation they're chasing is a you're like you're an idiot you fucked up you failed like this technology is too radically different to try to introduce it to somebody at that age and have a very high success rate in creating new users like you need to go after young people who will just get used to it and it becomes the norm so like they're gonna fuck this up it, like i do not see this succeed like i do not see my parents running out and getting a fucking oculus ripped to go on facebook like my dad hasn't even played a 3D fucking video game. Like, he never went past Super Nintendo. Yeah, let, let's go, let's all go on Facebook and meet all our thousands of Facebook friends that we have no idea who they actually are. We just clicked add. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh my god, I don't even understand how, v, how Facebook itself is still making it, and VR just seems like a pipe dream at this point. But I mean, like, I imagine there will be some interesting use case with some of that holographic lens and some of the other stuff coming in the future where you're not, like, staring at this screen that's trying to create this entire generated world. But, I mean, yeah, I mean, Facebook, you know, they've been going down, I don't know, this idea is about getting people to just sort of you know, play around with Facebook and VR. Yeah, it just seems like I don't understand how that's supposed to. I don't understand how that's supposed to bring them any profit. I mean, I don't understand how that company stays afloat other than selling information to governments. It's yeah, just, just ads, dude. It's ads. Like, I mean, it's like I think but, this this is something that people don't understand for the most part. And but it's hold like, up, how many of users bubble? are real? No, but here's the thing: is like, like I'll, I'm. It's, it's, a, it's a whole thing but um like you know everybody looks at the the tech bubble like the, the whole like tech phase where we're, like whatever the fuck you want to call it where we've had this huge economic explosion of all these tech companies like it's it's an illusion like it's bullshit like we have not had the the computer revolution like that because like all of these companies that are successful like unless they're building hardware or selling software they're just ad companies. Like there is no tech revolution here. They are just companies that were able to take things and business models that were not profitable and made no fucking sense and just pay for them anyway by shoving advertising into the picture. Like that's all that happened. Like this whole situation is a mirage in that way. Yeah, I want to quote audio video tweaker who said it's just VR chat with more data stealing and boomers. <laughs> yeah, man, I get that picture of uh, what was that where there was that picture of um, Mark Zuckerberg walking around smiling while everybody had a VR mask on. And it's just like, yeah, this is the Orwellian future that they'd like. I mean, because really, like, yeah, maybe they're an advertising company, but they're not advertising stuff to sell. I mean, like maybe they are, but really it seems like it's more about trying to build out a program to where you can try and influence people's decision making on advertising different, you know, political viewpoints, but also like, yeah, I don't know. You try to get people like the information from them and then you try to pump out some sort of ad to maybe they'll be more enticed to buy it. But it's like you're not making a bunch of money from selling mothballs because i'm talking about mothballs you're making a bunch of money from selling this tool to the government that is going to get people to buy mothballs because i told you to buy moths yeah. it's it's a friggin mind control thing man yeah i mean i just want to add know like the way. you do not know the way brother let me show you the way <laughs> yeah i and i just want to add like 
it would like I would find it super cool to like for people that I would actually want to meet and talk to it would be so cool to have a VR experience where you know I mean <laughs> like you could actually l make it look like you're meeting in a physical room like that would be amazing like think of the way that you could do virtual conferences with that it would be so yeah. amazing but like the, the reason can, that yeah like this whole yeah. show could just be screen capturing a VR environment we're in yeah, and, and but the reason that I'm not at all excited about this is because there is no way in hell that Facebook or any of these other companies really that are building this stuff, there is no way that they're going to build it in any kind of privacy preserving way. So I'm like, unfortunately, I can't be interested in it. I can't, you know, I can't find any joy in it because I know that it's just going to be used for privacy violations. And it's well be based on privacy violations, so it's like disappointing because this would be so cool in the right context. And if someone ever does do that, that would be awesome. But it's not going to be Facebook. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just like while we're on the subject, I saw something about uh, Libra's basically on its last legs because yeah, nobody's going to allow that either. Oh, All right, Janine. Yeah. Next kind of Bitcoin, not Bitcoin thing. I don't. Yeah, we're going to talk about this, it. We're anyway. talking a lot of not Bitcoin, but close to Bitcoin. But, but this one seems really cool. What's going I mean, on with these honestly, sad soldiers? Real quick, it's like I hope we do this more often because it shows that this space is getting bigger and other shit more relevant to it. Well, that's yeah, I'm sure. I mean, I tried to make it a bit Bitcoin connected there by saying at the end that we should do virtual Bitcoin conferences with VR, but uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> or Bitcoin Twitter meetings <laughs> where we can yell at each other, and yell, at each, uh, yell at projections of each other. <laughs> and I did say Libra, so we're in the clear. There was some Bitcoinish stuff there. Oh my yeah. God. I can't. I'm sorry. Just one last thing before it. But let, let you oh jump in, but now I can't get the idea out of my head now of like just I being able to change my entire avatar to a GIF that will annoy you instead of just <laughs> in front of your face. Yeah, and have it have it play some of that creepy music that you <laughs> use on the music <laughs> pot. Anyway, so this, I mean, I, I, again, this is another story. It's not directly Bitcoin related, but I, I made it Bitcoin related and you'll see how. Um, basically, uh, Mustafa, who's a security researcher, tweeted a few days ago that he and another analyst had been wondering, um, I'll quote directly from him, wondering why Twitter exposes PSYOP operations from country, he could have just said PSYOPs instead of PSYOP operation, uh, PSYOPs around, from countries around the world, but not the UK or other Five Eyes countries. It turns out a senior Twitter employee is a part-time officer in the, U in the UK Army's uh, PSYOP unit. Um, and then he linked to a report from the Middle East Eye who wrote that a guy named Gordon McMillan, who is the head of editorial at Twitter for MENA, which stands for Middle East and North Africa region, is also a part-time officer in the 77th Brigade or Information Warfare Unit of the British Army. And um, this is not even secret information because, once again, um, as we learned with IC Watch, people in the intelligence community often share their resumes and work history and positions, even current positions, uh, publicly on or semi-publicly on sites like LinkedIn, which um, in this case, Macmillan um, has recently edited to remove those connections, uh, but obviously people found them. So according to the Middle East Eye, the, um, the 77th Brigade, uh, let me quickly check this. Um, the 77th Brigade uses social media platforms such as Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, as well as podcasts, uh, -oh, uh data analysis and audience research to wage, uh, what the head of the UK military, General Nick Carter, describes as information warfare. Carter says that the 77th Brigade is giving the British military the capability to compete in the war of narratives at a ta tactical level to shape perceptions of conflict. Some soldiers who have served with the unit say that they have been engaged in operations intended to change the behavior of target audiences. Uh, what exactly Macmillan is doing with the unit is difficult to determine, however, he is he has declined to uh, answer any questions about his role, as has Twitter and the UK's uh, Ministry of Defense, or MOD. 
Um, and Twitter would say only that we actively encourage all our employees to pursue external interests. Um, the MOD, uh, Ministry of Defense in the UK, said that the 77th Brigade has no relationship with Twitter other than using it for communication, which is not exactly denying that they may use it to communicate, you know, <laughs> psyops, but whatever. Um, uh, furthermore, uh, they say at its launch, the UK media was told that the new unit of, quote, Facebook warriors, and this is why I put it under the Facebook story, uh, would be around 1,500 strong and made up of both regular soldiers and reservists. Um, in recent months, the army has been approaching British journalists as well and asking them to join the unit as reservists. Um, end quote. So this is not a clear Bitcoin story, but I thought it was important to mention since a lot of prominent I mean, for one reason, because a lot of prominent Bitcoiners use Twitter and there's also been previous previous incidents with spies um, in various countries abusing their positions um, in relation to Twitter uh, to benefit their government or intelligence related jobs. Um, for example, in mid-December 2015, it was reported by Motherboard that a small number of Twitter users, uh, several of which were connected to the Tor project in some capacity, um, or, uh, quote, vaguely associated with the security community at large, were told that their accounts had been targeted by state-sponsored actors. And Twitter did not respond to requests for more information or updates um, but in October 2018, so a year ago, the New York Times published a report on a Saudi spy who had, quote, risen through the ranks, I almost did a Elmer Fudd there, at Twitter, um, to an engineering position that gave him access to personal information and account activity for Twitter's users. Um, and I also want to bring it up because uh, a little while ago, I had published an investigation on Suzanne Templehoff, the founder of the BitNation project, because leading up to becoming interested in Bitcoin, she had been running businesses serving the U.S. Departments of State and Defense in Afghanistan and Libya, um, running SOP campaigns during conflicts there. And in fact, one of the companies that she ran for those purposes called uh, Shabakat um, Corporation um, claimed to engage in various asymmetric warfare tactics being key leader psychological assessment and engagement that was for the Pentagon and State Department and then um, that company later shapeshifted I think around 2013 2014 ish into um, they they're basically their focus was hiring liberty loving entrepreneurs and activists as consultants on like alternative governance and international living and things like that. So if you paid attention to BitNation at all in any depth, um, uh, they had and also they had and probably still have severe management issues um, because Suzanne is apparently a pretty abusive employer. And I think there was an article in Bitcoin magazine about it, but it didn't go into full detail, obviously, because people want some privacy, but and they didn't want retaliation. Um, but I've, yeah, I've talked about her a few times, and if you want to hear more about that, that backstory is in episodes 122 and 180. Um, and I also, the investigation I mentioned at the beginning, you can find that at um, my blog. It's titled A Match Made in NATO. But anyway, uh, so the main story, I think people in Bitcoin, the reason that people in Bitcoin should care about this is because, um, you know, you might end up in a particular country or set of countries where in the meat space where you can become a target of intelligence officers who are working at Twitter. And since I just did that episode of Tales on the Crypt talking about privacy, I'll say it again, but I should keep telling people that you should not consider uh, Twitter DMs to be private. They are not private. It's not a private messaging channel. It's at best private from your followers, but it's not private in any meaningful way. So be careful out there because basically any of these people, uh, including this, uh, you know, I mean, I'm sure they have a hierarchy of access control, but it's probably a wider pool of people who can access your DMs than you think. And they're not that far away from being able to access them surreptitiously if they wanted to. So yeah, you should keep that in mind. Yeah, I mean, like, this is definitely a Bitcoin-related story. I mean, it's one of those where, you know, it's kind of hard to see, like, 
where's the finance or where's the economics? It's like, no, it's the game theory and the intelligence warfare that we've been playing for a long time. And yeah, I mean, there are definitely guys that work with intelligence agencies that are operating in these various tech companies. And yeah, I mean, like I've been seeing the reaction from that Tales from the Crypt episode you did, and it's pretty, you know, it's one of those things where it's like you think you know, so everybody else knows, and it's like it's it's kind of, I don't know, it's a little freaky that a lot of people still just see like, oh, you know, Twitter DMs, they don't, they don't, they can't read that, or oh, that message, they didn't see that, or they didn't hear that, or it's like, man, you guys need to like snap to it and start to understand the capabilities of these systems and the way that they're networked together and, you know, these geographical lines you may be crossing you know, that might put you in a big danger because, you know, there's some, you know, yeah, there's some sort of uh, people there on the ground that are able to sort of pinpoint a person and sort of pluck them out. It's, uh, I mean, like, you know, we were just looking at the whole, what is, what was that? The the rise in Egypt, what did they call that? The Arab Spring and all of that. I mean, it's like, you don't think that was just uh, people organizing on the ground in Egypt, do you? Like, there was intelligence agencies behind that. Yep. Well, and there was also counter, <laughs> there was also counter to intelligence operations to that. So it's like, based, yeah, it's like, well, yeah, this is like some the- legitimate people and then a bunch of intelligence agencies from various parts of the world fighting with each other. Right. And this is like getting back to the, what Facebook is selling, you know, it's like all about just trying to get people into something like whatever it is, be it, you know, an Arab Spring or Mothballs. Yep. All right. Yeah, that's a, I'm sure that's another one that's going to freak people out, but you know, it's important that you bring these stories up. And I mean, like any of these stories that you find that you think, um, you know, or maybe just tangently Bitcoin related, but are security related and, you know, in this vein, I would definitely can just keep bringing them up. Oh, and for uh, Audio Tweaker, or wait, who said it? Sheep saying that we should put the show on Telegram. Uh, that would not work because I can't use Telegram because it requires a, it requires a phone number to use. <laughs> yeah, stop with the crazy ideas that aren't going to happen. Uh, also, Telegram is shit. Uh, so should we jump to the next one then? Yeah, let's get into something that I don't even know what this is. Like, other than the fact that there's some craziness going on in Ethereum, what's going on? So, um, there is a smart contract, uh, and I, I want to make this clear. Like, I am unclear whether the operator of this thing, Fairwin, wrote this contract <clears throat> or is just using it. I'm not completely clear on that, but <clears throat> Fairwin is, is just an outright Ponzi scheme um, using this contract on Ethereum. <clears throat> and it's pretty much, um, you know, you lock up your money, invest it, air quote, and you get a dividend every day. And you have to wait so long before you can pull that money out, or you give invitation codes to people and get a reward for that. So it's, it sucks in money and then pays people out of the, the new money coming in. And yeah, it, it's literally a Ponzi scheme. And it says in the, the, the site's thing, like if the contract balance is zero, the restart mechanism will automatically be started. When restarted, all accounts will be returned to zero and a new round of games will be started. So th- this is lit and... <clears throat> People like pushing this this Fairwin thing are like being upfront about the the restart part, but are completely trying to obscure that everybody loses their money when that happens. And this is a contract that's eating up thirty three percent of the transaction volume on Ethereum. Is is and is the highest um, amount of daily active users and ETH as far as any contract on the ethereum chain like a third of that network is literally a single ponzi scheme running that's it and this fucking contract allows the people using it whether whether they they actually wrote this contract or not to just take the money slowly out of this contract by sending it to themselves instead of 
the, the people who've invested in it. So it's literally an, op- an outright Ponzi scheme where they can exit scam with a delay in the exit scam at any time. Like, this is absolutely insane. Like th- this is <clears throat> this is the DeFi revolution. Like this this is this is what what Ethereum is going to bring to the world. Yeah, man, just another bloated contract to take your ETH. <laughs> but it's like, yeah, it's, this is this this is the kind of shit that that has. Uh, you know, the people in that space going, we need to figure out how to make this base layer fit more of this shit. Or, you know, we need to, to raise the, the gas limit to stuff more of this shit into the system. Like, this, this, is, this is a third of that network right now. I mean, like, this is... Like, if, if this is not a clear indication that that network is just a scam engine, I, I don't know what the hell is. Yeah, man. I mean, at this point, it's like a lot of these networks that are, you know, more well-known name networks. I mean, like, yeah, at this point, if you still have your money in there and your time invested in these projects, I mean, I really don't. I mean, like we've been saying for a long time that there's problems with these networks and it's really hard to even say that you feel bad for them at this point because it's definitely they didn't do their own research. The information's out there. It's not like we have to tell them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, before anybody says it, it's like, yeah, people use Bitcoin for for scamming people too. But I dare you, if you want to say that, to go find anything as far as scams or Ponzi schemes that use Bitcoin that even gets close to having that kind of percentage of the total Bitcoin network activity. But you won't find it. Yeah, and even still, like, I I mean, like, yeah, I don't know. It just seems crazy. Like, this whole thing is, like, uh, driving a uh, consensus debate over there about raising the gas limit and all that stuff where, yeah, I mean, I don't know. This is where it's just like with the Zcash story earlier, and this is similar vein. It's like these problems have been coming and coming and coming, and if you think that they're just going to go away tomorrow because – you know, they found out about Fairwinds. Like, get ready for another one. It's going to be right around the corner. Mm-hmm. All right. All right. You so- could say Ethereum is the thing that uh, does the biggest scam Bitcoin brought. So if there would not be Bitcoin, there wouldn't be Ethereum. So it's pretty much Bitcoin's fault. <laughs> Oh, goodness, yeah. We could twist and turn the psychology around. <laughs> no. But, okay. I don't think this one should take this long to really go through. But um... I mean, yeah, we've talked about this next story a couple of times already. So, uh, you know, we should be able to breeze through it. Yeah, so the, uh, the Lightning CBE... Uh, that they, they came out uh, the last couple days of last month. Um, you know, this was pretty bad. Um, the the like how it could actually be exploited in each different version of uh, Lightning clients is kind of different. But the gist of it is pretty much that um, none of these clients actually checked to make sure that the funding transaction that opened a channel um, existed or was. You know, you know that that's the most extreme case but like some of them would like check it but not check all of it like they would verify the input the the key but they wouldn't verify the amount and make sure that the amount in that transaction matches what they're being told is in the channel and um, i think it was pretty much um the C lightning was vulnerable to just like pretending you open something with nothing. Um, LND, um, you know, in different versions was mostly vulnerable just to the lying about how much was in the funding transaction. And then um, Eclair, I believe, um, was um, the complete, um, but you could just be completely fooled if I remember correctly. But, you know, the the core of the issue really, I think, isn't about the bug in the code itself. It's about the fact that there's there's a specification 
for the lightning protocol. And it's, you know, that doesn't exist for Bitcoin. Like coming into the, the space, like that's something that, that a lot of developers had to get used to. It's like, you know, you have a specification for a protocol, like that's, that's something that's gone through all the review, all the checking, you take that specification and you do exactly what it says as if it is the word of God. That, that is how you're supposed to treat a specification. And, you know, Bitcoin, you kind of had to learn if you're developing it that there, there isn't that there. Like we're dealing with just the code. And now jumping into developing for Lightning, it's like, oh, there's a specification again. And so, you know, I think personally, you know, as, as a non-developer, as somebody on the outside, that it's probably, it, it was just something people fell into to just blindly follow the spec again. Just like a comfortable habit built up in your development experience everywhere else dealing with this kind of stuff that was not really how Bitcoin worked. And you could just fall back into that. And, you know, it's shit happens. And, you know, this, this is a lesson that even though there's a specification here that you can look at like that, you still have to look at it skeptically. You still have to treat that like this could be wrong even though this is the blueprint that I'm actually like looking at to, to write code for. And, you know, the, I, I really don't think there's anything to say except like, I personally think it's very understandable why this happened just because of all the, the factors involved and it's a lesson. And I think that all the people involved in developing on the lightning network, I, I think they're, they're all smart enough people that they've learned that lesson. And I don't think this, this particular kind of, fuck up is one we're ever going to see again. No, I accept that wasn't the case. I was uh, watching Nicolas Dorier trying to figure out on Twitter that how, how, how this thing could have happened in in multiple clients uh, and he was saying ah it's probably the specification everyone was following them and the reply from i think from rose beef was no no lnd was actually uh did it before the specification ah okay then then everyone is copying uh, the code from lnd and uh, and reproducing their bugs and Oh, no, no, actually, see, Lightning was <laughs> doing yeah. it before <laughs> LND, so I did not, I don't know what was the resolution of that conversation, but it doesn't seem like it was the specification that, that's, that caused this. That's absolutely what that was, like, is what I've heard every other developer say, like, the entire conversation is focused around, like, that was not included in the specification, and one of the first responses to this bug was, adding that to the specification that you have to check this input. Yeah, so, okay, it, it, it's possible. So it's not included in the specification. Uh, well, uh, basically the specification was written uh, side by side with the code, so, yeah. No, but that, that's, that's what I mean, it's like you, you... Like everybody's been working on putting this specification together and then when it's there, it's like everybody goes away and it's like we've already done the specification stuff, just code it now. You know what I mean? And like you, you have to still have that, that kind of skepticism even after everybody settles the spec and walks away to go code it. Yeah, well... Yeah, I mean, this is something that we talked about with, uh, we just had Nadav Cohen and Jack Mallers on, both Lightning Network developers, where we talked about this. And yeah, it did seem like the Bolt spec was like the bottom of all this as the root issue. And it seems to be taken care of. I mean, you know, what are you going to do when you're bootstrapping a network and you're trying to get a bunch of developers working on it? I mean, you build a spec and then people can start working from there. And so, yeah, it doesn't seem like... Uh, doesn't seem like it's, yeah, I don't know, just seems kind of reasonable or logical that that would happen and play out that way. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, they've take, taken steps to do responsible disclosure and people have updated their nodes and, you know, this is something that happens in development as you run into bugs and whenever it's 
live fire networks that have real value on it. I mean, there's a reason why the lightning network has been hashtag reckless since its inception is like there are bugs that are coming. And when they do, you know, there is a possibility that those funds could be uh, vulnerable. All right, let's move on to some happier news. How about that? How about Yay! that? Yeah. <laughs> so just uh, before the show, a uh, pull request was merged into Bitcoin Core. It was about making batch 32 as default address type for the RPC interface, uh, which like uh, everyone is using that, uh, at least a larger companies. Anyhow, it is. it was already the default. It will be the default from 0.2. Uh, in the GUI, and now it will be the default uh, in the RPC too. So yeah, batch 32 adoption. Let's see how this this affects uh, this. This will be very interesting because now we can we can really see that uh, on chain that how important our defaults are. <laughs> Yeah, I I think there will be a big jump there. Woo! Heck yeah, man! See that bet thirty two? Let's go! All right, so yeah, that was just uh, that. I mean, we can keep going on. Block headers over DNS. <gasps> she know? Yeah, this. Uh... I just I saw this uh, when somebody else tweeted it, and it's actually a little old, and I didn't see it because uh, Blue Matt blocked me on Twitter. Uh, so I wanted to kind of go <laughs> through this just because. Don't don't even get me started around on this bitch, dude. It, it was I, I you know what I'll I'll make it a final thought, and I'll go get the okay. tweet that he blocked me for, and you'll see how completely fucking ridiculous it was. But. Like pretty much, um, he's he kind of wrote a little um, snippet of Rust code um, that would just snatch block headers uh, fed through the DNS system, and like he was kind of just like throwing it out there as like you know doing this in Rust. Like look at how simple this is to audit this code to be able to grab block headers from a different source, and you know I think the the interesting thing is here is you know. Delivering that over, um, you know, through DNS sec or through like HTTPS over DNS, or I mean, or DNS over HTTPS, um, you know, you can kind of have this new source now um, with kind of a, a identity check built into the DNS system, and you know that that does have a lot of issues and security problems, but you're using it to get block headers. And inherently, you can verify the proof of work of block headers. And so I just think, you know, this is an interesting, uh, you know, thing to think about is that you could effectively just have, you know, base web protocols um, delivering block headers from central feeding points like this. And, you know, it's, it's something that it gives more options on where to get those from because you need those headers to validate the, the chain, a block, the contents of a block. Um, it, it's always nice to be able to grab them from more sources for uh, cross comparison to have a higher degree of certainty you're on the same chain. And, you know, I just think this is, this is a nice, interesting thing. And I really can't see any serious downside to people building services like this and i see a lot of like small like fringe benefits all over the place for those types of services existing so yeah i think this is you know another it's a it's a neat little idea that uh, matt has like most of his ideas and i think this would be a pretty fucking cool thing to see like over the next year or two as something people start you know actually offering as a, as a service point so one downside, which is not really that big of a downside, or maybe you don't even consider it as a downside, is that everyone is, every programmer in the world is familiar with transferring stuff over in one way or another, but definitely not this way. <laughs> yeah, I know, but it's, you know what I mean? It's, it's really, like, this shouldn't be much more complicated than, like, a, a socket call. You know what I mean? 
Ah, oh, do you know how complicated the socket car can be? <laughs> nope, and I do not want to even get into that right now because sockets are black boxes to me and I want to keep them that way. <laughs> Which sockets are you talking about? Uh, Linux, uh, Windows, or OS X? <laughs> Um, the one where Python makes it a really simple thing that I don't have to think about on any level. Yeah, that's that's okay. Yeah, I, I try to do that too. <laughs> yeah, it's you know, it's I think I think this is it's a it, it's a useful thing, and it's like really what major way could this cause any problems? You, you know what I mean? Uh, like, how can this lead to like somebody being attacked or defrauded or losing money? Like, I don't see how something like this existing makes those kinds of like problems possible where they weren't already possible. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's neat. Yeah, man, <sighs> that's just like you were saying. Blue Matt, he works on some interesting things. Sorry to hear that he blocked you, dude. Yeah, like I said, we'll final thought that, and it's it's ridiculous. But um, yeah, okay. So this next thing up, um, I don't even know where to start with this. Um, my mind is completely fucking blown by this. Yeah, you were telling me about this earlier. You said that there's some uh, Bitcoin maximalist economists now. Um, so there is a, um, I think, um, Bayerish uh, Landsbank. I think is how uh, you pronounce it. It's a um, a Bavarian bank that does a lot of business in Germany as well. You know, they, they have a it's, a, it's a nice, well-established bank in that region um, in a couple of countries around there. But their research division um, published a, a seven page report, um, Mega Trend Digitalization. And the subtitle is, Is Bitcoin Outshining Gold? And th this entire report, it just it it blows my mind fractally on like every level. Um, first of all, is that this is pretty much a, a professionally done application of a stock to flow um, ratio model on the Bitcoin price, and they are reinforcing a lot of the thoughts internal to the space as to the the value of that and the legitimacy of that and you know the the, the big part in the beginning is, is kind of comparing this to um, bitcoin stock to flow ratio and how that works and was engineered versus things like gold and just how impactful stock to flow ratio is in terms of the price of something and you know they, they even look at um, the Hunt brothers, if, if you're not familiar with that story, is two brothers in the 80s who tried to re-monetize silver again. And they completely um, just got destroyed. Um, they, they bought up a shit ton of silver, pumping the, the price on the market, and then the raising price increased the production of silver the market was flooded with that and it crashed the price down you know this is called the easy money trap like something with too low of that stock to flow ratio well when the price goes up more is going to come on the market drop the price and it, it fails at monetizing and you know they, they kind of look at the fact that gold you know it's it literally took all of human history for gold to build up to the kind of stock to flow ratio it has where new supply can't influence the price as much as it did and it's like that that attaining that that stock to flow ratio is literally something that took all of human history and the the important part is when you try to kind of model of this you know you you get a a line effectively um logarithmically on how this this kind of progression should work you know when you can look at a trend of stock to flow um and how that changes and it's you know bitcoin is specifically engineered with an exact public predictable supply change making all of this completely mappable ahead of time and looking like right now bitcoin's um stock to flow ratio is higher than platinum palladium 
and silver. And, and the, the most important thing at this part here is when, when you look at the, the, the relevant graph in the, this paper here, you can see that platinum, palladium, and silver are all much higher above the line in this graph than Bitcoin or gold. And that's showing there's a lot of demand that is industrial, that is not based solely on the stock to flow ratio. The, the whatever you're talking about being a, a monetized like value storage asset. And Bitcoin has already surpassed the, these other major rare er, metals. And n the next happening after this one, the, the 2024 happening, is going to put us right where gold stock to flow ratio is. And like the, 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 cr the even crazier part about this report is it is citing anonymous Bitcoiners analysis of the stock to flow model throughout <laughs> the entire analysis in this fucking paper. Like they, they are citing anonymous Bitcoiners, like a um, hundred, a um, hundred trillion USD, like the, that, that guy on Twitter who really started pushing out the stock to flow model. They're citing him in this stock to flow analysis from the, or the research division of this bank and they are projecting based on the assumption that only 1 million coins are lost that we're going to hit $90,000 um, in the net, this 2020 happening in response to the changes in the stock to flow model and I will tell you right now there are probably way more fucking like uh, lost coins than just a million coins as far as actually trying to model this correctly. And, you know, pr pretty much the, the, the conclusion of this paper is Bitcoin is specifically designed to surpass the stock to flow ratio of gold, to have the highest stock to flow ratio of any asset that's ever existed and hold that. And pretty much they're looking at the 2024 happening um, and and that that uh, that hitting the the stock to flow ratio of gold and then moving past it after successive happenings as kind of the make or break like the, this this bank is effectively looking at the 2024 happening and how the price reacts to that as the determining event as to whether Bitcoin is just going to start gobbling the economy alive and this is an actual bank in Europe that that is publishing this report and this research and that has looked at and cited these things by just anonymous Bitcoiners in that research. Well, I mean, that stock to flow model is powerful, man. I mean, that got released earlier this year and ever since then, I mean, do you stock to flow is kind of a meme at this point. And, um, you know, if these banks aren't paying attention to it, then I mean, like, yeah, anybody who's got their their gut in finance and they're trying to manage wealth. I mean, if you're not looking at that model and looking at the fact that the Bitcoin happening is right around the corner and you're not paying attention to this, I mean, like, uh, it's going to be real upsetting on the other side of that when this market runs away from you. I mean, you know, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, I've talked to several people where they're like, how in the world do you think the price of Bitcoin is going to reach $100,000? And it's just like, Man, there are people that think this is going to get to a hundred trillion. Others that think this is getting to three hundred trillion. And I mean, those are crazy models. But I mean, like it follows this stock to flow model that does actually make a lot of sense. And when you explain it to people, I mean, and they're they got their wits about them. They're like they kind of like nod their head. They're like, oh, this does make sense. And then they start looking at the numbers, and they're like, well, that doesn't make sense. Like, I mean, I can't. It, it, they just can't envision it yet. But you know, cut to a year from now or a year and a half from now and uh you know a bunch of people are going to be kind of just shaking their head back and forth going i can't believe that that whole thing was right but i mean like i've handed that model to uh some smart people that work at a bank and i haven't heard back from them since i handed it to them i mean like i kind of got the idea that they really ran with it and they're setting up uh as much shop as they can to be prepared for that yeah and i mean it's like this is I think after this next happening, we are going to see 
dominoes fall that lead to a radical attitude change in a lot of the legacy financial system. I mean, dude, think about it. That's when the election is happening, too. Right? It's like there's so yeah. much going on right then. It's crazy. Yeah, it is a, a huge confluence of events. I mean, let me put it this way, man. Um, I think it's interesting that Bitcoin was designed and launched in a way that happenings coincide with our presidential elections. I, th that's dude. interesting. That's interesting, man. I mean, like, gosh, dude. I mean, it feels to me like at least we got Bitcoin. Bitcoin's kind of like a Kevlar vest in this moment where you're like running from cover to cover. And there's like these moments where the bullets are flying and it's just real kinetic energy. And you're going to be lucky if you get to the other cover alive. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's nuts. All right. Did you guys have anything else to go here, or we could get on to some, like, uh, some, I guess, some crypto ratings? Oh, I'm good. All right, man. You mind posting the link in this for the chat here? Because mm -hmm. uh, I'm about to go on it. So, all right, guys. Yeah. I hope you're ready, ready for our new ratings, Overlords. I don't know if anyone remembers back in 2017, late 2017, when Weiss decided to take a crack at rating digital assets to determine if they were good investments. But that was a hilarious failure. I mean, they were uh, putting some of the most shittiest shit coins up at the top and Bitcoin near the bottom. Well, now we are seeing a more serious attempt to rate cryptos based on the ability to discern if the asset is a security or not. Not whether it's a good investment or not. But whether it's a security or not will probably inform people's investment decisions. I'm not talking about the newly... I'm talking about the new recently created CRC or Crypto Ratings Council. This board consists of some major players in the United States. Companies like Kraken, Coinbase, Bitrex, Circle, and Grayscale are building these ratings. The CRC website says, quote, We formed the Crypto Ratings Council to create a framework to consistently and objectively assess whether any given crypto asset has characteristics that make it more or less likely to be classified as a security under the U.S. federal security laws. <laughs> federal securities law. Close quote. And then if you continue to read on their website, you'll see how they judge their assets. Quote, our framework is derived directly from case law and SEC guidance and has been structured to emphasize objective, repeatable, and fact-driven responses that can be answered more consistently across different assets and across the same asset over time. And that the analytical framework results in a score between 1 and 5 for each asset we review. A score of one means the council's analysis suggests the asset has few or no characteristics consistent with treatment as a security under the U.S. federal securities law. A score of five means the council analysis suggests that an asset has many characteristics strongly consistent with the treatment as a security. Close quote. So right now, if you go to the CryptoRatingCouncil.com, you'll see they currently think the only other coins outside of Bitcoin that isn't a security is Litecoin, Monero, and DAI. I don't really understand <clears throat> how DAI is rated a 1, Ethereum is a 2, and Maker is a 4.5. That's pretty confusing because you don't get DAI without Ethereum and Maker. So... I don't know. Yeah. Well, I'm pretty confused and this certainly doesn't make much sense right now. It's unfortunately the best we have. Marco Santori has a nice tweet thread on the whole topic that's linked in the show notes. He correctly says, quote, an overwhelming amount of time and money is wasted every day by crypto projects and the infrastructure providers, exchanges, custodians, etc. that support them to just to figure out whether they'll get sued for doing so. Close quote. Congress. Oh, and this is some more quotes from him, actually. This is a string of quotes. So let me get through this. Congress can't seem to help. Making new laws is not something they're good at these days, especially for a contentious industry full of stakeholder adversity. SEC can't seem to help. On one side, they're stuck with the existing laws, which are too ambiguous to offer meaningful guidance. On the other hand, besieged by negative headlines no matter the direction they choose. Anyway, their job isn't helping its investor protection, close quote. So while this might not be the best system, it's what we currently have to work with, and it is self-regulation from, from within the industry. It's what Mark is calling the hot or not of crypto. I kind of like that. 
So uh, what did you guys think about this new ratings board council and how exactly this is all going to play out? Um, this seems more like an after the fact shit cover our ass. See, we're not being fucking scammy retards um, type of play. But yeah, I, I am all for uh, self-regulation, self-regulatory organizations. But the minute I see Coinbase's name in something, um, no, that's oh, yeah. going to be a bag of retards. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, I don't, yeah, well, all I'll say is that, yeah, I mean, they're the ones pushing the earn DAI, invest in DAI, learn how to use DAI, definance. That's all what DAI is about. And, like, DAI is somehow related on the same level as Monero, Litecoin, and Bitcoin, which it's incredible to me because, like, seriously, DAI wasn't even anything, not even a year ago. Like, it was last crypto winter party here in Boulder where we were using DAI for the first time and it totally screwed up. There was a couple of times, like, eventually somebody had to buy our beers with dollars. And I mean, like, you know, the whole system is reliant on MakerDAO and Ethereum, which both of those didn't get the one. I mean, it just makes me seem like they want investors to think DAI is okay to invest in when, and De DeFi, whatever the hell they want that ex definition to be. And uh, yeah, I mean, that seems to be like the main, like, if, if you're looking at all this, it's like that little bit of information kind of sticks out it's like it doesn't make sense they're pushing that network hard sounds like they just want more investors and die yeah i mean it's like you know it's 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 incentives too you know what i mean if, if you have a bunch of companies that get together and try to figure out the the most minimal amount of kyc they all need to collect to like be able to keep the government off their back and like do that and keep each other in track on that like okay that the, the incentive there might work but when the when the, the situation is we need to pick and choose which of all these coins we we show to idiots to make money um our scams or not yeah the incentive is to really label as few of those as possible as scams or securities regardless of what they actually are so i don't really trust this kind of dynamic with, with this specific issue. Like the incentives are not properly aligned. Yeah, I got you on that too, man. That's what I was looking at. The main thing was like, okay, you know, these look like uh, the main people that are pushing these similar networks. It's like, uh, these are all the big major players in the United States. Like, where's Gemini? Where's, uh, where's, I don't know. There's some other major players around here. Where's Shapeshift? Yeah, where's Bitstamp? Like, you know, these are... Where's Wasabi? <laughs> we need to get Wasabi over here. All right. But yeah, that's uh, that's our crypto ratings. And that website audio was uh, CryptoRatingsCouncil.com. And uh, you can check out all their ratings there, any our viewing audience. So, all right, guys. It's time to get into it. The big story from the week. Yeah. Most everyone was screaming about this on wait, Twitter. The wait a moment. Okay. Did no. you said did, did you said crypto ratings council dot com? Yeah. Yes. Then it's probably my pronunciation that yeah. I don't know. It doesn't Okay, matter. wait a minute. It's not an S, it's crypto rating council dot com. Okay, so no S. Crypto rating council. Ah. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Have a fun time looking at all those assets and start thinking about where you should invest your money. Sorry about all that, right. guys. Red team, go! Red team, all right. go! Yeah. This is big news. I mean, most everyone was screaming about this on Twitter the past couple of days. I'm talking about the SEC fine against Block 1. On Monday, the SEC sent out a press release saying they had accepted a fine from Block 1 for the unregistered security sale from June of 2017 to June of 2018. That was for the EOS network and that sale raised over $4 billion. Now the SEC is accepting a fine at less than 1% of that money raised, just $24 million. Stephen Avakian, co-director of the SEC's Division of Enforcement said, quote, a number of US investors participated in Block.1's ICO, Companies that offer or sell securities to U.S. investors must comply with the securities laws, irrespective 
of the industry they operate in or the label they place on the investment products they offer, close quote. Then Stephen Pikin, co-director, of, also a co-director of the SEC's Division of Enforcement, said, quote, Block.1 did not provide ICO investors the information they were entitled to as a participant in a securities offering. The SEC remains committed to bringing enforcement cases when investors are deprived of material information they need to make informed investment decisions, close quote. Now, all of this, like we're saying, caused a big stir on Twitter, and there was a lot of tweets about it. But by far and large, one of the top comments was from Eric Voorhees saying, quote, Really sad to see many in the crypto world upset that Block One wasn't fined even more by the SEC. They had 24 million taken from them. Some of y'all are more like Elizabeth Warren than Satoshi Nakamoto. Close quote. Yeah, all right. I don't know what to say about this because it does piss me off. I mean, I've experienced friends who fell on hard times and had their lives ruined because they stole more than a couple hundred merchandise and dollars from a business. We've all seen that poor guy get choked to death on the streets of New York City for selling loose cigarettes. Now we see guys like Dan Lammers and others like him sitting on the bleachers of white-collar crime, taking in billions from investors, but because it's not technically quote-unquote stealing, it's perfectly okay. Look, I don't care that billionaires and millionaires lost money in EOS. I do care that our justice system here in this country has been bastardized, and it's frustrating to see our inability to provide actual justice. I'm not a king libertarian that thinks all governmental systems should trail to zero. I think a rule of law is important, and without it, our country stands very divided. And so, yeah, I kind of got upset from the situation, too, and I wish, you know, guys like Eric would understand that. Bitcoiners see injustice on many levels. I mean, that's one of the reasons I'm in Bitcoin. It sucks to see a prominent Bitcoiner like Eric not understand people being upset. They, you know, they spent... More on a domain, for God's sake. I mean, Block.1 spent $30 million from vo- for Voice.com. This is a $24 million fine for the unregistered sale of an ICO that resulted in $4 billion. All right. Let me calm down just a minute. The real story here is that the SEC might consider some of these assets asset sales as unregistered sales securities. However, with the settlement, it seems completely worth it to spin up a scam network and sell it under a bullshit block producer decentralized theater because you'll only pay a minuscule fraction of the money raised for doing anything illegal. Maybe. I don't know. We'll talk about that since this next story is kind of different. But uh, Catherine Juan on Twitter, or at KD underscore Juan, had some good takes on uh, the settlement there that I didn't come to, so I'll just read hers out. So these are some quotes from her on Twitter. Nature of settlement is Block.1 neither admits nor denies the allegations, meaning can't be used against them in proceedings with other enforcement bodies, regulators, or private civil suits. SEC says attempts to limit U.S. purchasers by blocking IP IP. By IP blocking, insufficient given no ascertainment whether purchasers were in fact U.S. persons, and a number of purchasers were in fact U.S. persons. A hefty penalty at $24 million in the scheme of the $4 billion raised, by, but by no means disgorgement, I mean that, I mean that no money needs to be returned, at least not under this settlement. Close quote. All right. So, yeah, this has been a big buzz story on Twitter, and there's been a lot of uh, opinions flying around. Did you guys have some on the matter? Yeah, this yeah. is, like, this is insane. Like, because, you know, I, I resent the, the, the kind of, like, throwing in uh, with, with, like, thinking they should be fined more because this pisses me off. Because... Like my, my what I'm pissed about isn't like they didn't pay more. It's it's the entire context of the shit that these regulatory bodies engage in. Like I thought we're supposed to be like those those things are there to protect people from fraud. They have for years denied every single Bitcoin ETF proposal under the bullshit that this market is completely manipulated but you're completely fine with the total scam that eos is where all all these promises of users checking the block producers with vote is bullshit 
where the idea that this is an open platform is bullshit, where the idea that the, this system is dynamic is bullshit. All of the fucking EOS is in the hands of exchanges. And the only exchange I know of that lets people decide how theirs is going to vote is Bitfinex. All of these exchanges have pretty much voted themselves and other businesses they know into these block producer positions. And the entire resource limitation design in EOS, the, the virtual RAM and storage and, and processing shit, is all completely in the control of the block producers to manipulate, which is effectively manipulating the economics of the entire system. So I, I'm no, I'm not pissed that the fucking government didn't find them more money. I am pissed at the insane fucking hypocrisy when you look at the type of attitudes and arguments made with something like a Bitcoin ETF versus how they handle something like this EOS presale. Like, go fuck yourself. Like, I'm pissed about the complete wildly roll the dice to see what we're going to do this time and the inconsistency. Not that fucking EOS didn't have more money taken away. Yeah. Janine, do you have something too? Yeah, sorry. I was uh, just going to quote Jameson Lop. I don't know if he was commenting on this story in particular, but I think his comment was still relevant to this. Um, I think it was yesterday he tweeted, if you find yourself worrying about whether or not your favorite crypto asset might be classified as a security, you've already lost. <laughs> yeah, no joke. I mean, like, yeah, to me, I think one of the major things is like, I'm just thinking about, yeah, the regulators and the way that regulation is put forward and the way that that all works out. I mean, like, yeah, it, they have a $24 million official fine. Let's just think for a second, how many millions under the table do you think they push to those regulators just to get that sort of fine? Like, I mean, you know, there's, they raised $4 billion, $24 million in fine, like, I mean, you could give those regulators a hundred million and that's still just a very small fraction of that money raised. I mean, like, to think that this is all the money that was required for this sort of uh, settlement is absolutely horseshit. I mean, this is where it, like, pisses me off that this, the way that our current system is, and this is the way systems have been forever, we've just sort of tricked ourselves for a long time, is that money is the governor. Well, and also I don't, I don't really see what the fine accomplishes. Like it doesn't, it's not enough money for them to like go out of business where they're not going to, I mean, if they're, if the whole point of the SEC is to like stop fraud, I mean, this isn't going to stop them from doing more fraud. Um, it's also, I mean, I don't know. It just, I don't see the point of the fine. Like, I don't think it doesn't, it's kind of like the way they find banks where it's like, yeah, we'll fine you just to like give a hand wave to all the people protesting on Wall Street, but it's not actually going to affect anything. Like the biz the businesses are still gonna keep going. So I really don't know what the point of this was. We are the new banks. <laughs> I mean I mean the the only point I can see is that it's like money. Just take people's money. If you can if you can, you know, justify taking taking people's money to fill your coffers, you might as well do it, but it's not going to actually have the effect that you claim it has. Yeah, I mean, this is where it's like, yeah, I mean, I don't know, to me it's like the anything that this settlement did was it just gave people the okay and the thumbs up to create 2017 or, you know, ICO Mania 2.0. And this time, like, you know, all gloves are off because now we have clear guidance that, like, you know, as long as we got this sort of BS decentralized theater in there and it's quote unquote sufficiently decentralized and, you know, if they do give us trouble, it'll be less than 1% of the network. Who gives a shit? Chads. All right. So let's move on to uh, something where we can talk about the SEC's uh, enforcement further. On to, yeah, this next SEC enforcement story. Let's spin the wheel of justice. This time around, we have Sciacoin and the company Nebulous. Nebulous allegedly raised a little over $120,000 in their 2014 ICO. 
Now, almost five years later, the SEC has charged Nebulous to return all the funds raised plus civil penalties and of an additional $100,000. Aw, sorry for playing. Thanks for playing, guys. Hope next time you play, your enforcement action is more on the level. All right, so Joseph side, this is true. Saya settled out of court for repaying their $120,000 raised with an additional civil penalty of $100,000. Nebulous COO Zach Herbert says, quote, We were disappointed that the SEC chose to take action with respect to the relatively small offering conducted years before we have the benefit of guidance. However, we are pleased at how the company and the network fared under such intense regulatory scrutiny. Close quote. All right. So, yeah, here's another enforcement action from the SEC. And I really don't know what to make of all these recent actions like we're talking about because... uh, When you think about the situation with Kick, Ken, and Defend Crypto, and what all they're going through, and then you think about what this previous story was with Block.1 and EOS, and you talk here with uh, Saya, it just seems like the enforcement is all over the place, and it's not really formulaic in any way. But what did you guys think? You know, I was just... Sorry, real quick. I I, I was going to just make a joke, but, you know, it just occurred to me, like... What do you guys think the chances are we find out in like five years that all of these projects that they decide to actually take enforcement actions on are just because competitor shitcoin projects weren't fucking spamming the SEC with complaints? That is a likely I would I would say, yeah, I would probably be on the long side of that bet. So what I wanted to say is, wasn't Saya Queen that was fucked over by Bitmain by... Yeah. Yeah, so they actually had a business plan. It just, just Bitmain decided that it's going to destroy it. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So yeah, they they wanted to sell miners. Yeah, I think they actually forked Bitmain too in that whole story. Yeah, they um, yeah, they they, they forked the uh, proof of work and invalidated just uh, bit names um, and in a silicon basics and not their own. Yeah, well, that probably gave their credibility a lot. So, so they gained much less than how much they expected to to gain by selling the miners because that that whole misery of it between there just made people less. Well, maybe more of our actually, but but less confident. I don't know. Just it's yeah, just, but, not like, not trying to. But like you know, to to like look at like the the EOS and the the Sidecoin thing. You know, what I mean, to get it's like this is this is insane. You know, what I mean, it's like I I haven't gone that deep in, in Sidecoin, but like, and I know people who who do. Or have um, have have told me that there's a lot of problems and, and things to solve. You know what I mean? But the kind of long-term problems something like Sciacoin has that stand in the way of it not being a scam are so much less than EOS. Like EOS has a fucking unobtainium wall that there is zero chance they're getting through. Like something like Sciacoin actually could, I think, build shit out and become a, a viable system in the long term and it's like eos here just give us a tiny little bit like whatever who cares like you're, you're literally committing fraud but oh sia coin i'm give us twice what you fucking raised and you raised like almost literally nothing i mean that that's insane like that's absolutely insane like the, the fucking inconsistency the lack of a consistent rationale is fucking crazy yeah, I mean, like, for sure, the uh, Sia coin is a lot further, I would say, down the road of what could be called something of a decentralized project than EOS. I mean, like, their whole block producer thing was kind of screwed from the get-go, like you said. I mean, like, you know, these people with the most stake just vote themselves in, and now, boom, what do you mean, decentralized? Mm-hmm. All right, guys, I think that about wrapped it up for today. Yeah. So, uh, final thoughts. I guess. Uh, All right. You know who's got uh, who's got theirs, and we'll let Rick go last. Yeah, let me start because it's just gonna be a 
a quick one. So I'm going to be on the Transylvanian Crypto Conference next next week or after next week. So if you guys want to come, come. Heck yeah, awesome. Transylvania, man. That sounds cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, how about you, Janine? Uh, my final thought is that uh, I've mentioned her before, but there's uh, an artist who makes the comic Fisheye Placebo, and she just released uh, a new page of that comic. It's like, it's. I think she's been working on it for like at least four years now. It's been taking a really long time, but she released a new page that is inspired by what's going on in Hong Kong still, so definitely check that out. It's um, You can probably find it by just searching for Fisheye Placebo, and I've also retweeted it. Mm-hmm. And I guess mine oh, yeah. is... Um, I, I wanted to firstly thank uh, you know Matt and Marty for all the digest shilling uh, they did with the interview with Janine. Uh, yes, much thank appreciated. you. And um, also, like, if, if you haven't listened to that yet, like, go listen to it. Like, those two are one of the the few good content producers in the space, and the interview with Janine was amazing. So go listen to that if you haven't already. And I guess Rick, uh, your turn. All right, yeah. So my final thought today will be my last final thought in a good while. Today is my last episode on Block Digest for at least a couple of months here. If you've followed us for a while, I'm sure you've heard me mention starting another podcast. You might have also heard me mention something about turning the meetup into a nonprofit and trying to build a Bitcoin embassy here in Boulder, Colorado. Well, all of that takes a lot of work, and I'm at an inflection point here. At the end of this month, on October 31st, I'm supposed to be giving my Introduction to Bitcoin presentation to a bunch of Google developers in Chetumal, Mexico. I'd really like to have the first episode of this new podcast out before then, because uh, the first episode will also be that Introduction to pre- introduction presentation I've given at Google. There's uh, nothing conventional about an Introduction to Bitcoin yet, and mine is much more of an introduction to myself and the network. So it should serve well as an inaugural episode. The goal of the new podcast will be to create a dialogue between the Bitcoin network and Boulder, Colorado. There are a lot of unique reasons why Bitcoiners of all stripes should pay attention to this little area of the country. And I'd like to bring that to our viewing audience here on Block Digest. So I'll be gone for a good while from the standard show, but you'll be seeing me again real soon on this new endeavor. You don't have to run to another channel. This new show will be coming through the Block Digest YouTube channel. And uh, with this new show, you guys will get much more involved with uh, what I'm doing here in Colorado. And you'll get to meet more of the people that I work with here locally. And you'll get to meet my new co-host. So uh, look for that. And lastly, before I finish this thought, let me just say Block Digest has always been an ever-evolving show. There was never a roadmap that maintained a singular format for this show. And... And this thing's just going to keep going. So, uh, yeah, I'll be back in time. But for now, i got to work on this. And lastly, don't forget to attend your meetups, people. It's important to build that local community. Mm-hmm. Wow, that was real professional. No surprise coming for a, from a Google employee. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And now yeah. I would like to recommend that everyone, this is not an endorsement of Google, so you should go and visit restoreprivacy.com because it has a list of alternatives to Google. <laughs> Or, yeah, uh, I'll say like uh, just yeah. I'm not working for Google. I'm working with them, and you know, hopefully their developers will get interested in Bitcoin and privacy and start doing some things like that. Yeah, this is really cool, and uh, good luck with everything. And we're going to miss you, and I'm going to miss you especially because now I need to talk more. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> yeah, Shinobi's going to be dragging those comments out of you guys, but that's all right. Yeah. You know, uh, I'll definitely be listening. I'll be in the troll boxes every now and again. So it'll be fun. You know, it's always fun to shake things up. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, you know, it's we're, we're going to be here fucking trying to help you build that up any way we can. And your spot is here waiting for you when you have time again. Like, you know, this is, I, I, I wish you luck, man, and want to see you do the fucking best you can because this is like the kind of shit that we talked about when we first started this show is continuing to branch out and do more stuff more diverse stuff to actually try to accomplish it and like you know you're fucking actually doing it man
Hell yeah, man. I'm really excited about the future here. I know that uh, there's a lot to be built out here and it's just going to take a lot of my time. So I'll be working on it and, um, you know, I'll be tweeting more and, you know, coming out with all that stuff. So, yeah, hopefully everybody will be, you know, we'll be able to move along, move forward with this thing, like all of us, not just me. Mm -hmm. All right. So I guess, uh, yeah. It's gonna suck uh, without you for the next couple of months, but you know we're we're still gonna be here putting stuff out, guys. Uh, I'm gonna try and grind more shy two fifty sixes, get some more special editions out of us, and uh, maybe maybe one more thing following shortly after uh, Rick's show launching as far as new stuff, but we'll see. Heck yeah, man! New stuff, new stuff. All right, guys, so I guess uh, I hope you enjoyed this episode and watch the stuff that comes out the days after it. <laughs> I, I don't know. My, my brain has too much serious shit to think about, Rick. I just get, <laughs> get, me, get us out of here. All right, man. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed the show. It was a good discussion today, and uh, you'll see the guys back next week. Later, everyone. Later. Bye. Auf Wiedersehen. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs>